No, you have to assert yourself, Moon. All right, all right, all right. It's, <laughs> it starts when we it say is time, it starts. Yeah. and we're starting. So, hello, and welcome to the Game Factory podcast. Um, I guess before we get started, I should let um, my you know co-hosts introduce themselves. So, I guess kick it off to Mike. Hello, I'm Mike. Um, I'm Mike Biffle. I make video games. I'm an indie. I made um, well lots of other things, but then Thomas was alone is the one people have heard of, and then Volumes, the new thing and making, I think, like, seven games right now. I'm not sure how many things we're fiddling with, but doing lots of things. And Andrew? <laughs> Hi, yeah, uh, I'm Andrew Smith. Uh, I run Spilt Milk Studios, which is a one-man studio at the moment. Uh, we've just launched Tango Fiesta on Steam. We did some mobile stuff before then. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mike. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a sort of a, a designer by trade, so... Cool, and I am Mu Yu, um, and a long, long time ago I made some pretty cool console games, and since then, I don't know what I've been doing. Um, so, <laughs> I wanted to spend... <laughs> you're not going to do the names? I'll do the names, if you're, not, if you're too humble to do the names. Mu okay, so worked. Go on, the, 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 the games. The game that I worked on that you may have heard of are Ratchet and & Clank and Little Big Planet, um, and I made a bunch of other stuff that nobody's played. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about why I'm doing this podcast um, and sort of what, I don't know, what it means to me. And I guess the core of it is that, you know, I make games professionally and I love it. Um, but as I was growing up, it was never something I considered. It was sort of this route that I sort of happened upon really luckily. And I just want to make sure that people out there that sort of, you know, like games but don't have any idea how they're made could sort of think about it and see how the industry works and maybe think about how they could get their foot in the door. Um, so sort of, you know... Considering that, you know, I never ever considered that I work in video games, I feel extremely lucky. Um, I thought I'd ask these guys, um, when did you guys decide that you want to make video games? I guess, Andrew, if you could go first. Uh, wow, it was a very, very, very long time ago, I think. Um, I was probably about six or seven. Um, it, was, it was around about the time I first got my first Edge magazine, I think. You know, that was the time that um, I sort of graduated, if you like, from CVG and, and things like that, and official Nintendo magazine. And... Um, and then at the back of Edge, they had actual adverts for jobs in the games industry. And that was when I realized that you could do that, uh, which is completely crazy. Um, so, yeah, it goes goes back a long, long way for me. Mike? Um, I was I was kind of a bit of a late bloomer because I, was, I wasn't that into video games when I was, like, really young. Um, didn't really have access to them. Like, my first console was a Dreamcast, and I'm way too old for that to be the case. <laughs> um, like, cons like, games console, I just, we didn't have them. I wasn't allowed one, or I wasn't interested in them, I guess. I was more of a Lego, Lego kid, so it was always something I played at, like, friends' houses and things. Yeah. And then I had no idea that you could actually, like, make them. Like, I always yeah. assumed it was just, like, a computer somewhere made them. <laughs> um, so I, it was like for me it was like not until like my late teens where I started like feeling like I wanted to be there because it seemed like where all the cool stuff was being made like yep. films came, seemed a bit boring TV seemed a bit boring I was like games is where people are making kind of cool entertainment so that was the point for me where I started focusing on that cool. and I guess you know like what were the first steps that you guys feel like you, you properly took towards getting a job in games uh I guess for me it was um, Half-Life modding was probably the first thing. Uh, that was that was after my dabbling with Edge. You know, Half-Life came out when I was about uh, 17, I guess, um, just before I went to uni. And um, yeah, I got into the mod scene instead of doing my A-levels um, using things like uh, Worldcraft. It later got rebranded as Hammer. Um, and this is the original Half-Life, by the way. So uh, this is when <laughs> Team Fortress 1.5, I think it was called, oh, wow. uh, being played. And um, as sort of, as an, I guess, as an anecdote, me and another friend of mine who's also in the industry, he uh, he lived quite nearby. We both had very similar interests, and we would spend the occasional weekend um, watching, you know, uh, Matrix on VHS uh, and other awesome action movies and then whilst one of us was doing that the other one would be making a little short sort of level for the other to play once they'd finished and then we'd sort of swap and tweak and swap and tweak it's someone, sort of hot seat someone in the, the uh, someone in the chat's asking what mods do you work on oh crikey um <laughs> so uh the first one was actually one of the matrix mods there are about eight nice. <laughs> Um, and uh, um, oh god there were several but there was another one that I started that, that, that carried me through university as well um, called uh, Blue Moon Rising which was like a zombie thing 
uh, very very cheesy. And then we actually did one at uni, um, me and my flatmates. Uh, so I won't take the credit. I, I was one of the two uh, design, level designers on that. Uh, called Mini Mod, and the, essentially it was Micro Machines as an FPS. You were running around as little toy soldiers in nice. giant kitchens and stuff like that. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of crazy. Um, so cool. And uh, yeah, funnily enough, one of the one of the guys who was involved in that now, like we're talking like you know ten years later, bumped into someone who had played that um, oh, wow. and still <laughs> apparently plays it, which is just like mad. Amazing. Yeah, they should play some new games. There's like there's been quite a few <laughs> oh, games in the last ten years. Yeah. <laughs> um, and for me, it was, um, I mean, I, I used to play around, my dad taught, my dad worked in IT, so he kind of taught me how to, like, program. I remember making, like, I remember making, like, a Lion King sing-along game, and I made a, <laughs> I remember making, like, a rubbish Star Trek first contact point-and-click game at one point. Nice. Um, but for me, like, the first time of actually playing with, like, a real engine was weirdly making maps for Mech Commander. Do you remember mm -hmm. Mech Commander? Like, the top-down yeah. RTS-like kind of thing. Yeah. And, just getting obsessed with that as a kid and making i made like um i worked out how you could make it that the enemies couldn't see you so i was made so i made a stealth mech commander <laughs> like seek level path like in my head it's like a 10 hour epic i imagine it was probably like you know two two squares two tiles or something but it was like it was real to me um and then just kind of playing with that stuff and kind of learning to code but only ever learning to code as much as i needed to yeah. make the next thing like yeah. it was always that, that approach yeah that's cool. I I wonder if it's because you guys are more you were more like PC gamers, where I was like you know staunch console kid, and so you know I always just thought you know games are these things that just get imported from Japan, like and they're made by these <laughs> Japanese men, and I like you know I never really thought like oh you know that's something I could do, and it's like, it seems like you guys got into it quite early. So I guess from you know doing sort of these mods and that kind of stuff, like did you guys both go to university for it or? We're both awful university people, aren't we? <laughs> I think you, you, you went to uni, didn't you, Smithy? I did, yeah. I went to Abate. Um, oh, that's the good one, though. That's the problem. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's, um, yeah, it was it was strange around the time that... Um, so, you know, I sort of decided and, and I was choosing A-levels that would hopefully support that. that. So I did art, um, English and design, and three uh, design separate from art. Um, and uh, yeah, there were three universities offering anything even vaguely video games related. And at the time, in, in, and with the mod stuff, I was doing levels, but I was also doing a bit of uh, 3D modeling. So I was looking at arts courses rather than programming. And uh, yeah, it was uh, Bournemouth, um, Abate, and uh, Middlesex, I think. I'll have to excuse that card. <laughs> um, and. Um, yeah, so so I didn't like you make three choices after a level, and so I had three, and you, uh, the top one, Abate, actually grabbed me, which was which was great, and it was a it was a really varied course. It was called computer arts, but we did uh, game design, uh, uh, we did music and audio, we did uh, uh, straight up art, but on a computer. You know, uh, it was it was pretty <laughs> pretty broad. <laughs> That's cool. I did. I went to um, Newport Uni uh, in Wales. Uh, which wasn't as classy as Abate. It was like it was a newer course. I think I was in actually. I think I was in the first like year of their game design degree, um, but it was kind of grown out of the animation side of it. So it was uh, so that's that's where I kind of learned all that and kind of was always in that kind of art school, film school part. Um, so it was more leaning in that direction. Like I think I was the only. I think I was the only student in my graduating year to actually make a video game. I think nice. everyone else just kind of made like screenshots for imaginary games or something, which was interesting. <laughs> um, but that was fun. So, but it was good. It was good grounding, and obviously, it's where where I met my girlfriend. So, Aww. obviously, very, she, she's over there. So I have to say that. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> she's shaking her head at me now. Um, but yeah, so that was that was like Newport Uni was it was it was good. It was a good it was a good course. I had some excellent lecturers. I stay in touch with and. And uh, it was it certainly set a foundation for me. I wouldn't say it taught me many kind of amazing technical skills, but I think yeah. that's far less important at like the university stage than just yeah, have like basically what I needed was someone to come and like tap me on the shoulder and go, Halo's not the only game, mate. <laughs> like there are other games. Yeah. Like there is a there's a world outside there. There's a maybe you should look at architecture or theatre, <laughs> you know, just kind of like having my, my, my nerdy eyes opened a little bit, I think was really necessary. Yeah, definitely. I mean, so I went to UCLA, but yeah. at the time, I I think because I didn't know I was interested in games, I didn't really look for games programs, but there really weren't any um, anyway. I think there's a power <laughs> cut. I think, <laughs> I think, 
he seems all right. Is he um, there still? Hey, he's back. He's back. <laughs> yeah, cool. Awesome. Yeah. So, so I didn't really look for them, and it wasn't until I, I think, my third year of university, I had like the first year of DigiPen, um, and I was like, oh, I wish I would have applied there instead of here. But you know, I, I actually applied to UCLA as a philosophy major. Um, but then my parents were like, you can't get a job as a philosophy major. And so, uh, they sort of said all our friends, their, their kids are computer scientists. So if you study computer science as well, you can also major in philosophy. So I ended up focusing on those two things. So didn't really help me at the time, but you know, I've been asked by the audience to make myself bigger. So I've done that. I just want to let everyone know it's not (laughs) ego. Someone asked. Yeah, a likely story. Yeah, I, I'm going to slowly kind of engulf the entire screen <laughs> yeah. as the thing goes on. Yeah. Um, and then I guess you know, from after university, I guess did did the university experience help you in the jo- applying for jobs or finding jobs or that kind of stuff, or did you just sort of finish university and say, well, look, it's time to start applying? I mean, I graduated at a time where like it was kind of disgustingly easy to get a job in the British games industry. <laughs> I got really, really lucky. Um, and for me, it was just I, my final year project. Um, I kind of I, I made and I sent off. And at that point, like if you were a kid who'd made a game, you were already kind of in a very good position, um, which was good. But then, but I think the one that the way I got in really was that um, my friend who you already worked there put it on the internal forums and like nice. it just got pages and pages of like shitty comments, like criticizing <laughs> every ass because it was awful. Yeah. Um, <laughs> criticizing every aspect and then when i went to the interview like i went in and i was like and this is all the feedback that all of your senior staff gave and here's the new version of the game where i fix um, things and i think that was that just like i guess that impressed them that they were that i could take yep. criticism or whatever because to yeah. be honest when you're first starting out like doing your job and being able to take criticism are like basically all that <laughs> really matters like as long as you can just like listen and do what your boss tells you they're happy you know, yeah. down the line you can get cocky and come up with stuff, but like right at the start, that's all people seem to want. So, yeah, I, I think that helped. Yeah, I what think. Um, well, going back to your point, Mike, about like the practical skills at the side of it. Um, what was that? What was that? That, that is my cat invading my desk, <laughs> and she's headbutting the microphone now. So that's awesome. <laughs> it's warm, so you know, it makes it um, real. It makes it real. <laughs> Um, yeah, so so the practical skills we didn't really get many that were directly applied to to video games. That wasn't really the point of the course. But also, I mean, you know, we're we're seeing now even courses that that don't do that the right way. Um, um, so when I when I graduated, um, it took me a little while to get uh, any kind of job at all, <laughs> let alone one in the games industry. Um, but I ended up doing some QA for uh, Viz uh, in. <laughs> And, Sorry, I just um, saw your cat on the live stream. Just <laughs> oh, got it. Sorry, carry on. I apologize. Um, and I mean, I'd, I'd previously managed to basically fluke some QA like a couple of weeks, and then uh, and then one whole summer through a friend of the family, and then the guy who got the first two weeks essentially moved company and got me a, a summer placement. And then so that combined with the fact that I'd shipped a game in inverted commas. Combined with my portfolio of mod stuff, and and, and um, we entered Dare to Be Digital at the end of our course as well up there, um, and and spent nine weeks making a terrible, terrible prototype. Um, <laughs> um, that all basically added up to to. <laughs> 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 it's, like wow. it's like Jaws. It's like Jaws. That all added <laughs> up to uh, to getting, um, I guess, catching their eye and, and and proving that I could, you know, at least make something. Um, and like you say, like shipping something is really, really important. Showing that you've like back then there wasn't a lot. It was literally Half Life. Half Life Two came out after I graduated, so there wasn't even Half Life Two modding. Yeah. You know, it was Half Life One and Unreal Tournament two thousand four. I think was the thing that I'd used most. Um, so you could make levels, but making a game was like pretty much a step above that. You know, you needed a team. Whereas now, if you're applying for a job and is it as, as almost anything really, um, you need to have a game. Uh, like uh, uh, you know, that's that's going to be like the bare minimum for anyone's kind of uh, interest in you taking it seriously and all that kind of. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess for for me, I kind of got. I guess university was sort of where I got my big break. Um, I was like in a graphics programming class, and I'd made a, a demo that was like, um, like they basically were just like, oh, use these draw calls and make you know a bunch of squares and stuff like that. And I decided like, oh, I want to do something sort of homage or whatever, and I made like. A model of like cloud strife walking and like simulated grass or something like that 
And it just got one of the other students in the class was just like, you know, we just started, started talking to me. He's like, oh, yeah, I work at a games company. I'm going to E3 next week. And I, I just became fixated as like a game fan. I became fixated on the idea of I want to get to E3. Like, I, I don't really care about this game job or whatever. It's just like, I want to go to E3. And he's just like, well, if you work in the industry, you can go to E3. And I was just like, oh, can you get me a job then? He's like, actually, I, I, you know, I need to place an intern this summer. So, like, if you apply for this internship and you get it for the summer, then, like, we can get you an E3 pass. And I'm like, oh, that sounds great. Like, and that was sort of, sort of the That's way I sort great. of got my intro. Yeah, because, you know, I, at, at that point, I just never considered anything. Um, so, yeah, you know, I got that work placement. And as you said, like, I guess, you know, Mike's sort of situation of you knew someone at some studio and it really helped a great amount. Um, it sucks and, that it works that way, but yeah, yeah, yeah. It it does just seem to be that way, and it just seems kind of I don't know. Like, did you guys spend a lot of time like thinking about oh, I want to work here or here, or was it just sort of like I know these people, you know, let's let's pull whatever string I can get in to get in the first door. I mean, to be honest, yeah, like at twenty one, I was just I needed a job. Like, honestly speaking, I, there were certainly studios I really wanted to work at. Like, you know. Back then, it was like there were like the big British studios were Lionhead. Um, you obviously had like Sony Liverpool, Sony London. Um, Blitz, where I got my first job, was a great kind of first studio and kind of is quite well known in the UK for just like lots of cool people coming out. Someone in the comments has noticed that there's a reflection of a piece of proprietary tech uh, oh. in oh. that <laughs> door. So I'm not going to call attention to it. It's fine. I'll we'll die this for the rest of the. Uh, yeah. There we go. Um, didn't see anything? <laughs> didn't see anything. That no NDAs have been breached. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So uh, like like getting my foot in the door was the key thing. But yeah. you know it was it was an interesting time because you know Media Molecule was on the rise as well. Like I remember seeing the very first reveal of Little Big Planet when I was a, a student and just it blowing my mind. Like yeah. this is where video games are going. And, you know. <laughs> So, yeah. so I think I think I like I think I applied loads of places, but it really yeah, you, it's the yeah. video games industry. Like there were only about five studios back then. There weren't yeah. this enormous number of smaller studios to choose from. Yeah, kind of the same to be honest. Um, I was lucky in Dundee. Um, for people that don't know, Avatar Dundee, uh, Dundee is a city. Um, is where DMA Design were founded and GTA mm-hmm. was invented or whatever Lemmings and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and so out of when when rockstar bought or whatever happened and they moved to edinburgh um a whole bunch of people stayed um and made a company called viz uh visual science sorry there's viz and there's visual science it's very confusing (laughs) um and then that just basically meant that there was this whole um like ecosystem of devs basically you know there were enough people there working for enough companies that were old enough to have families and kids mm-hmm. and mortgages. So they're like, I don't want to leave Dundee. So like whatever happens, if a company goes under, they'll just form another studio. Um, and so, yeah, I was, I was lucky enough that um, I got the job at QA and Viz and then a uh, junior level designer at Visual Science. And that was just through basically persistence and the fact that, you know, I had a portfolio and they were local, uh, which was great. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was definitely not a case of wanting to work at a specific company. It was just yeah. wanting to make games for a living. Like, what, what yeah. could be better? Um, turns out quite a lot of things. But, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, don't do it for the money, kids. Don't do it for the money. Uh, <laughs> it's, um, no, it's, it, it was just like, like, like Mike was saying, you, and, and, and move, it's, you need to know people, you need to get your foot in the door. You know, um, back then, I guess, even now, like Scotland's, far enough away from land and that you, you you can just nip to um you know events that were put on and 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 i think this is even before Eurogamer was an expo you know i mean it was it was it was crazy times crazy early so uh, we got to go to gamescom that was cool yeah <laughs> yeah i guess for me it's like i had my internship which was um at a company called flipside and they were owned by vivendi at the time and, and vivendi owned well. Blizzard. Um, they were like a really weird web por- or web games portal. They just oh, okay. did casual games, stuff like that. But the best thing is because the parent company was Vivendi, I got discounts on all Blizzard games. So I just, you know, ordered the entire back catalog of Blizzard games there. And then so the guy who got me the internship there, him and one other guy went to a console game company. And so the next summer I lined up for another internship at this console games company. Um, and then the the other weird coincidence is that E3 that, you know, like, you know, I was so eager to go to all about, I got um, a disc for Ratchet & Clank demo. 
And so I played the Ratchet and Clank demo, and I was like, oh, you know, this seems really cool. Like, you know, what what could what could be the harm of applying there? <laughs> um, so I applied for that position, and I, you know, I. I couldn't believe it at the time, but yeah, it's, you know, they called me back and said like, yeah, we, you know, we'd love for you to start on Monday. And I was just like, sure, sure yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be there. No problem. But that's such an amazing opportunity to have like so early <laughs> in your career, like to yeah. work on something as like well-known and you can go exactly. to the movie on the first day in the audience, <laughs> the front row. Yeah. And, 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 and I think, you know, even beyond like, you know, getting like good titles on my CV and so, so on and so forth, like the talent in that building was just unbelievable. You know, there's there's no question you could ask that wouldn't be answered. You know, like there's, you know, like the the quality bar of everything. Like you know, everything you did was always like, oh, you know, that 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 works. But you know, you might want to try this. You might want to you know think about this. And I don't know. It, it was just you know a really great place to learn stuff so quickly. Um, but yeah, I mean, going back to the application process, what did you guys find like, you know? that actual process to be like, you know, sending applications and the interview process and so on and so forth. Were there any like, you know, we weird things that surprised you in that process or? I mean, it's tough, isn't it? It's really scary. I remember being incredibly intimidated by like making sure my CV was, was right and all this kind of stuff. But, but honestly, it's like, I think it's like all of us are saying like, and it's so weird kind of, cause it's, it's kind of feels like it's advice that's probably out of date. But back yeah. then, genuinely, if you could make a half decent video game and put it on a CD ROM and put <laughs> it in an envelope, like you would get a job. Like it was the yep. it was a it was a golden age for that because it's really hard to describe to like devs now who are just kind of starting out or coming up and it's like this indie thing is not how like there was that period, like in the late eighties, but by the mid nineties when kind of I well, no, like the early two thousands when we were all like going out into the job market, yeah. like this had the the studios had kind of locked in you know there it was no, there was not an enormous indie scene introversion was starting to do their thing there were definitely like little kind of beginnings of this stuff but like being someone who could actually make a decent little flash game that yeah. didn't look awful and take it to an employer that was a mega deal or being able to make like a really good unreal map or whatever like yeah. it's it was that was that was exceptional in a way that it's not anymore i get the impression like yeah. i look at student work now and like cvs and stuff and just it's embarrassing how much better <laughs> yeah. than me at that age they are and it's amazing and awesome and inspiring but at the same time it's like i don't think i would have got my first job like nowadays <laughs> yeah 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 i mean that uh, we it's going back to that whole thing of like if you haven't got a game like back then it was you know if you've got a game you're like on the top of the list um now it's like if you if you if you're at the top of the list maybe you should probably be selling that and yeah. thinking like you know like if you if you're if you're the cream of the crop these days but um but yeah like i i didn't get that intimidated by it i i i, I don't know why not really i think i was just <laughs> annoyed at not having a paying job and i was yeah. just like screw this um um, but um, yeah, I mean, it was it was really standard stuff. You know, you had a portfolio, you had a CV, you went in for an interview um, uh, as a as a level dis well QA. They they didn't interview for it's like if there are no typos in your cover, that's <laughs> their job. Yeah. Um, and I don't I don't mean to like it, yeah like as long as you can communicate in English like that's that's yeah, QA yeah. right um, and. Uh, then for the, the level design stuff, obviously, yeah, the portfolio, and we, we had like an interview process, which was an interview, um, yeah. and it was very, there was there was no test, it was just a, very much a sort of a personality check, I think. Got it. Um, and then, I mean, I like to say that, yeah, the only interviews that have ever gone badly are the ones that I've held as the interviewer, oh, okay. uh, because as soon as I was in, like, I don't know, it just feels like these days everything's a little bit more, uh, there's a lot more competition. Yeah. Mm. Uh, standards are higher. Um, the expectations are different, um, and obviously, different companies uh, expect different things of you. You know, the, the level design role, <clears throat> excuse me, was to join a part of a team that was five level designers strong, and that was one of the game teams at the company. Yeah, uh, and it was on a racing game, so you know they they were looking for a very specific set of skills, I suppose, um, not Liam Neeson ones. Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, whereas, yeah, if you're going to join a small team, it sounds obvious, but you know, you, you're expected to probably be a bit more of a generalist or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, yeah. but it's it's tricky, and I, I feel like now it's harder because you know there's there's, there's way less mega studios and more medium yeah. level or small studios. 
Yeah. And it's, you know, it's tricky as a small studio to hire someone straight out of uni. Um, and there's not that same. I don't feel like people are investing in the next generation as much as we yeah. could. Like, as you know, like, obviously, I'm well, all three of us are kind of in that indie kind of space, like hiring people, finding people to work with. Yeah. And I think the instinct is always to kind of hire someone, you know, or someone yeah, who's, exactly. who's reliable or someone who's worked for a friend or whatever, like yeah. finding those kind of fresh out of uni kind of people yeah. and giving them a chance is something that I'm really conscious of. Like, I don't feel that we collectively as in the, the industry are doing enough yeah. to do. Like yeah. when I came oh, up, like the companies that me and Smithy and, and sounds like you as well started at, they had you know they had lots of junior people yeah. as well as loads of really senior people and that seems to have worked better long term yep. right yeah i mean Mu, i was going to ask about like the whole internship thing i mean over here we like the visual science they had like a work experience person yeah. and it's a company of 200 people mm-hmm. uh every other company i've worked for has not really done it i mean uh, proper sure. games did but they were a bit of a, an exception um, is that an American cultural thing? Or? I think yeah. I think there's a really big culture in America of especially you know summer break. You know, like every team bringing in like you know one or two interns every summer. And like I think we we got to the point at Insomniac where we try to have like each team. You know, like the art team would bring in one, and the programming team would bring in two, and so on and so forth. Um, and it, you know, it's a combination of things. Like I think one of the things is that you're always aiming for that holiday release, and you know, like you know, just getting a little bit of extra you know manpower on board for a couple couple months is is actually really nice. Um, but sort of you know if if you get like 100 or 200 people applying for it, like you're going to find someone who can really actually contribute very, very quickly within the first two weeks. Um, and I think it, it it's very beneficial for them and obviously it's very beneficial for us. Um, I did two very different internships though. The first one, um, which was at Flipside, it was sort of, I don't think it was meant to be this way, but it was sort of, they would have me do things that weren't really mission critical, weren't, you know, user facing. So I wrote like a bug database for them or I'd write like, you know, little tools for the team to use and that kind of stuff. Um, And it wasn't until like um, just sort of like a staff juggle ended up happening and they lost someone and they needed me to fill in that they're like, oh, well, we've got this game team and it needs to be done and you've been doing good on these other things. So jump in there. Um, For the second internship, it was all it was production from day one. You know, it was just like, they're like, you know, this is, it was a company called Kush. They make sports games. Um, and they're like, you know, these sports games, there's like a hundred screens. You know, it's just like there's there's this screen where it shows these stats and this screen where you get to rearrange things and so on and so forth. Um, and they're just like, you know, just hit the ground running. We need to get all these things done as fast as we can. Um, and it was, you know, I think that was a really, really great experience in that you sort of started, I, I guess it's the first time I ever felt like I kind of mastered something. It's just like, you know. You know, the first screen was sort of a disaster. It took me like three days. And I actually remember uh, it was so bad. Um, uh, I spent three days on the screen. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on. I had to ask a million questions. And finally, I was done. And I was like, I had, you know, I put some debug, like print lines and stuff like that to like figure some stuff out. And I'm like, oh, I just want to revert a few files. I reverted everything. <laughs> um, and I was just like, I, I literally spent like, you know, three or four hours trying to recover those files. And, you know, obviously I never got them. And then I went back and was like, okay, I just need to do this again. It's, it's life. And it took, you know, like two hours. Mm-hmm. And it was one of those moments where it's like, well, I'm starting to feel like I actually understand what I'm doing. I understand like how, how production, you know, work is going to happen. And like from that point on, I was just like, you know, I can pro- approach each, each of these screens like, you know, Whatever it is, I'm just going to sort of follow the principles I followed last time and ask a few questions where I don't know stuff and just sort of start learning stuff. And I think, yeah, it's really great in, in America. And I think, you know, I, I'm trying to remember if we had any interns at Molecule. Um, I guess it might be less and less less of a culture here. I know um, at Mind Candy we had a few. Um, but yeah, I think it's really important. But as you said, Mike, it's it's really hard on an indie team. You know, it's like when, when you have a team of like three or even eight people, like if one person's not operating at a hundred percent speed, yeah. like it's really, really tough. Um, it's and I really think- hard. And and also just to like, because because obviously the investment you make when you're a big studio is you bring in someone junior. Yeah. And you know they're going to be shit. You yeah. Know you- <laughs> did I just drop the first swear word? I think I did. Um, <laughs> you know they're going to be bad, and it's yeah. like you know that there's going to be maybe a year or something where they're kind of learning the ropes. They're you know you're getting to place ammo crates around the level or whatever you're not getting them to do any of the really kind of high yeah. level stuff and then there's this magic kind of period like from a year to three years in 
where they're really good but they yeah. haven't realized they could be making more money elsewhere yeah. yet. <laughs> so you're like that's where you get your value you make the investment for the year and then you get your yeah. value here before they either you know leave or you have to pay them more yeah and, and it feels like that works when you have like a big heavy studio that's always just rolling on whereas yeah. with indie teams like indie teams are always like ballooning shrinking ballooning shrinking yeah. depending on the game like yeah. you know during volume like at the peak on volume like it was a crazy number of people but then obviously as the kind of project winds up you start to yeah, people start moving on to different projects or you know going overseas or whatever they end up doing to the point where now like we're getting by with quite a small number of people uh yeah. but it'll inflate again as we start the next thing but it's that's what i think you lose because the junior gets chewed up in all that yeah just, like, of course yeah 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 yeah. At, at um, <clears throat> Proper Games, uh, which is the one I worked at before leaving to start my own thing, um, we sort of did two two things around it. Um, one is uh, we, we got a lot of students in to help out with uh, focus testing and QA. Mm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and that was really nice because, you know, we were able to sort of, like, be the cool, fun studio that all the students are talking about at the university. We were, like, literally a 10-minute walk from Mavate, so there was a lot of talent there. I mean, that was like moving on to the second part is like that was one of the genuine like reasons why I think they did and the other ones didn't is because um, at the time like and I think it still is Abate is a very very highly regarded one back in the day when I was doing it I was the second year nobody had a clue really I mean they still did very well but it was it was building up so yeah we got um, there was oh God, I think at the most there were probably 14 employees at Proper Games on sort of one and a half projects and um yeah, we managed to get in uh, an art um, intern, kind of work experience guy, and uh, same on, on code. Uh, and um, yeah, it's, it, it, it was really, really valuable, but it, you can totally see why people would not want to do that. The, the, the management at Proper Games were really, um, they were just not the kind of people to ever really let the money drive all the decisions, which is one of the reasons it was great and also one of the reasons that it was a bit of a mess sometimes, you know, it's right. like one of those things. But it was so good because we were able to actually spend genuine amounts of time with these people um, and, and help them out. And I'm not sure where the artist is these days, um, but the, uh, the, the coder, he, he went on to like lecture video games um, in uh, Alaska, I want to say. Okay. Like that's where it's from. <laughs> Um, but then and now he's working at Microsoft um, oh, cool. and, and yeah it's just it's fantastic and that came from literally me doing a lecture and then him hanging around at the back he wasn't even supposed to be at that lecture um, and uh, and then him sort of dropping his name so yeah That's really cool. yeah I mean now that you mentioned that like it and in Somniac, there was definitely a trend of if you intern one summer, as soon as you graduate, you'd have a job offer. Like it was, yeah. it was almost you know a hundred percent the case of like you know we we've in, as, as Mike said you know we've invested a bit in you you know we're gonna try and get some value out of that. Um, but yeah, yeah no, it's just you know I think it was a really great educational structure at Insomniac with you know the juniors and the seniors and you know all the different levels and stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I think almost all the interns I remember were had job offers the next summer. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I guess yeah, one thing, that, but that didn't feel that felt like an amazing opportunity at the time, right? Like that's that's yeah. how I remember this. Like you look back now and you're like, oh, okay, so they that's a that's your that's a way of saving money effectively for them, yeah. right? But as, yeah. a kid, as a kid coming out of uni, I was just like, yeah, they love me. I'm really special and lovely <laughs> and awesome. And yeah. oh, oh, it worked though. Yeah. <laughs> I, one thing that you know I think is kind of interesting is that we we all talked about how you know we, we definitely didn't have the skills when we got hired for things, um, and I'm sure sure there's plenty of other people that applied that didn't have the sufficient skills to do the job. Like, what do you think you know sort of makes people stand out? Because because one of the things that really jumped out to me of like in Somniac, you know, after the first year, I spent most of my time you know hiring people actually, mm. and it, it got to the point where it's just like you look at someone and you sort of you really focus more about their attitude than their skill. I think, you know, there's always a baseline of skill of like, well, can you do the basics and like, have you put some effort into something and got over like sort of the, some of the hard, you know, challenges? Have you, have you seen a hard challenge and gotten over it? Mm -hmm. um, but then it's just like, from that point on, it's, it's really, you know, am I going to get along with you? Do you seem like you're going to learn very quickly? Do you seem arrogant? Do you seem like, oh, I know everything. I, you know, I want to do things my way. Or are you, you know, really receptive to this kind of stuff? And I think, you know, especially having gone through it, um, you know, going to Insomniac, having no idea, you know, how games are made and so on and so forth and learning all of it, you know, 
you would sort of meet someone and say like you're just going to take this for granted you know like i i was so lucky to have this opportunity and you know if i'm going to invest my time in you like so many people invested their time in me like you know i want it's not that for the company i want you to you put in this many hours to get this many things done it's just like i want you to be a better person by the end of this because otherwise like you know there's loads and loads of other people that are also applying that i think i can you know get more out of in the long run yeah, yeah. i mean i it, it, like you say, the attitude is is probably the key, and and you mentioned um, like uh, have have they actually got over the the main issue? And it's it's uh, not the main issue, but like the challenging aspect of whatever yeah. you've, you've presented them with. And it's for me, it's like um, you don't want in a big team or a small team. I think you want problem solvers. You want people who aren't afraid of it. You know, you don't necessarily want someone who's so bright that they just go, "Oh, I know everything," or, yeah. or, or yeah. you know, or or actually that they get everything right. Which because, is every twenty-two-year-old, right? Like, I, I, <laughs> yeah. like, like there is an arrogance that's there with youth, just kind of inevitably, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. But it's it's that whole um, the willingness to admit that you don't know, but you're going to try anyway, and you've got some smart ideas about how to. Um, video games development is insanely hard, and um, you know everyone's learning all the time, mm. and it's like such a stupidly young industry and the tech's changing and yeah. it, like everything is moving all the time yeah. and um, you know you need people who aren't going to sort of curl up in a ball because things have gone wrong because they will go wrong every yeah. single day <laughs> and, yeah. and to be fair like it's okay to cr curl up in the ball as long as it's like not for too long like everyone curls <laughs> up in a ball yeah. I, 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 like, I echo exactly what you guys are saying it's like there's the attitude thing like are you an arsehole are you going yeah. to annoy yeah. people in the team? Because then that's just negative energy. Yeah. But but kind of I guess more than that, it's just the kind of it, for designers especially, it's just it's communication and critical kind of yeah. thinking. Like basically, your prob your job every day will be to work out well, identify a problem, solve that problem, and then communicate to the team. Yeah. Not tell them how what to do, <laughs> but explain to them why it would be best if they solved it. Like it's a different. You know, it's very easy. I think people often look at design as like, oh, it's like being a movie director. And honestly, it probably is to an extent, but it's not like being a movie director in the way that most people think a movie yeah. director is. It's not that auteur <laughs> thing. It's not like you're the boss and everyone has to do what you say. Yeah. And and I think that's the one thing I constantly get from like young designers where they think it's going to be their job to boss around someone 10 years yeah. more experienced than them. And it's like, precious, no. <laughs> That's not how this works. Your job yeah. is, your job is the, ten, the guy who's been here 10 years longer than you is busy yeah. fixing <laughs> stuff. Your job is to work out what they should fix out that fix next. Yeah. And if you're right, they'll do it. You know, like I, I, I think that's the big one. Is it's just, it's just being able to look at stuff with a, with a clean eye and a critical eye and work out where things aren't working or and, and find a solution. And then you know, not anger everyone and communicate the the issue with people. That's that's and if you find designers like that, they're they're awesome. Like that's what you yeah. want. Designers should be the, the cool problem solver who's going to get stuff done. Are you are you fixing something or are you making a problem? Yeah. 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 Yeah, and I guess the... the <laughs> so he's the, laughing at me. <laughs> he's like, very, Mike, you've just described, like, that's not you. Not a problem. <laughs> um, the other thing is that I was thinking about is just like, you know, what did you expect, you know, getting into the games industry and how was it very, very different from, you know, what you were expecting and so on and so forth? <laughs> oh, it's so different, isn't it? Um, I don't know. I think when I... See, I wrote some notes on this, and um, when back when I was tiny, and I was like, "Oh, I want to make video games," you know, like I've I've always been into like world building, and I was into like tabletop gaming, Warhammer stuff like that. But I always I always liked writing the bit about why the armies are fighting more than the playing of the yeah. fights because they took forever, and setting up your miniatures was boring, <laughs> um, and you know, and painting the scenery and all this kind of stuff, like creating creating that side of it. Um, and I just thought, oh, this is like video games are like cooler because there's there's less effort as a player, um, and then yeah, it'd be fun to make you know, to make that mm -hmm. uh, be a part of that. Um, and that is that is absolutely part of the job, and it's one of the bits that I enjoy. But it's such a tiny part. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like it's yeah. mixed up with all of this other stuff that you just wouldn't wouldn't have expected. And I mean, I'm I'm trying now to sort of separate because obviously we're going to talk about other things in other podcasts, but. Like right now, as a as a as a sort of a, I say one man team. Of course, I work with with yeah. very talented other people. But um, 
like my day to day is so little design, uh, like by percentage, you know, like like sitting down and thinking up cool things and then working out the rules of those and then communicating them. As, as Mike said, so much of my job is just not that. But back when I was working at other companies, um, even then, I think the communication was was the thing that took the time and the effort. And, and as Mike said, you know, is 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 the crux of it. Um, anyone can have a good idea. It's a cliche, but it's true. Yeah. Um, it's about how you um, break it down and make it doable and make it interesting and fun and not broken. And when it is broken, you fix it. And making um, that idea not ruin the last 30 ideas you've had, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> exactly, right. Um, so, yeah, I guess, like, it's the way I just, I just, for so many reasons, I believe that the human part of making a video game is the yeah. thing that people always sort of uh, forget about because, and I think, well, I think that maybe nowadays this might be me sort of uh, projecting, but I think maybe there's a danger that that will happen more and more as tools and small teams, uh, you know, become the thing. Yeah. Um, you kind of tend to forget how important it is to have other people around you, smarter yeah. people than you, um, and 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 how important a part of the job that is. So, um, but that is as a designer, you know, and and I've always been. In a position where I have to just work with other people, like I can't just give a, get given a chunk of work and go do it. You know, yeah. it's it's inherently caught up in everyone else's shit, and that's yeah, um, absolutely. that makes it important. That and I can... you're interesting in like the indie space as well because you are you're kind of pure designer because you're. Am I right saying you don't code, do you? So it's you always you always have no. that need to. But that's cool. But but that's really cool because that means you always have to collaborate. Like it's always a yeah. part of the process that there's another yeah. person involved. And you yeah. work with you know awesome coders. You work, you work with Roper, who obviously I have a great focus <laughs> for. Um, but yeah, it's like it's so I, I kind of envy you that in the that you kind of always have to have that collaboration involved. Like I can lock myself in a room and make something, and it won't be good, but like <laughs> I could make it. Like and that's yeah, I kind of envy you. I think that's a cool step to have in your process. Yeah, it's interesting because I think I learned the same lesson as you guys about what the games industry is, but my expectation of what it was going to be was, I think, because, you know, when you're studying computer science, all of it is, you know, you're sitting alone in a dark room doing whatever, and you don't really, even like group projects, I mean, I, I wasn't a very good group member in group projects, I would usually be like, I'm going to do it, you're going to get an A, please leave me alone. <laughs> um, and, and it wasn't until, like, I actually um, was interviewing at Insomniac, and, you know, like, you know, they walk you around and so on and so forth. And, you know, the first time they walk you around, everyone knows you're walking around. You, you think, oh, this is a big show. Everyone's, you know, hanging out and talking together and all this kind of stuff. And you think, oh, this is for whatever. And then it's sort of on your way out you know, when no one's paying attention to you. You're like, oh, no, this is actually how it is. And there's all these people that are really excited about these ideas. And, you know, people that are working hard and discussing stuff and, like, trying to figure out what the best thing to do is. And it, it's, it's really interesting in that, like, even, you know, coding as a team was, like, a really interesting, cool experience for me of, like, when I sat down and it's just like, okay, so, you know, you do things this way and I do things this way. Like, how do we let me focus on the things that I'm good at and you focus on the things you're good at and how do we, you know, get the best out of everything? And I think, yeah, I completely underestimated, you know, the 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 human side of everything of just like I just sort of thought games is technology. The challenge is technology. And the challenge isn't technology. The, the challenge is sort of getting the people with the right abilities on the right page to sort of, you know, do their thing. And I think that's always been something that I never would have realized. I would have thought like, oh, well, the problem with, you know, the hardest part of making games is getting this many triangles on screen or this or that or whatever. And it's just <laughs> I mean, like, no. that is pretty hard, though, isn't it? Like, <laughs> I don't know. Not undersell that part I just download Unity and it puts <laughs> a lot of triangles on screen. You just, you just go on the asset store, you search yeah. for zombies, yeah. you're halfway there. Yeah, yeah. so... Uh, <laughs> Um, I guess we should probably ask the chat. Do you guys have any questions that you want us to answer? I've been trying to keep an eye on it, but I've been very, very bad at keeping an yes. eye on it. Yeah, um, it was a bit sloppy. But I also don't know how much of a delay there is um, between us and them. There'll be like a two-minute thing. Okay. So, well, not two minutes, like thirty seconds. Like, yeah. Okay. So we can we can sort of rant about you know or babble on about whatever and see if any questions pop up. Um, I'm sure otherwise, they will. I'm sure there yeah. will. People will. People will have opinions and questions. Yeah, 43 see, people watching. Isn't that weird? Yeah. <laughs> Tuesday's a boring night on telly, though, isn't it? Is The yeah. Apprentice on on Tuesday? But it won't start like now. Have you been watching The Apprentice? I have been watching The Apprentice. It's good. I like The Apprentice. <laughs> it's nice to be reminded that there are worse people in the world. Than <laughs> That's what I like yeah. about it. Yeah. Um, we will be getting questions, hopefully, now. 
Yes. Come on. One of the I, 43 of you that isn't a bot. I guess I can also scroll back up and see if there's any we missed. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, yeah, the, one, uh, one of the things... Oh, someone's we'll asking about your that. uncut pizza. I remember you tweeting about that, Smithy. Wait, what? Your oh, uncut God, pizza, you got, it was it was a it was it wasn't just first world problems it was like top one percent problems <laughs> <laughs> leave, leave. um so I, well, I mean, it's it's borderline related so i suppose i'll go into it <laughs> it was a it's you guys will know what it's like you go to an expo so this was at um birmingham it was at the uh egx um was it yeah it's straight up egx show this year uh, we were launching Tango there, and basically, like, it's exhausting. You you get up at 7 o'clock in the morning so you can get to the NEC, set up, spend all day on your feet trying to sell the game, maybe you do a talk, maybe you go to a talk, whatever, and then, like, you get back, and then there's a 100 other devs who all, like, they call it katamari uh where, you know, everyone's like, oh, we should all go for food, oh, we should all go to this place. Yeah, they're going to see 100 people. So anyway... Um, yeah, you get to the end of the day and you're like, I oh, I haven't eaten. That's not good. Like, there's four more days of this, and so yeah, we we ordered in. That was the plan. We thought like we, we thought ahead. We ordered in, <laughs> um, and uh, we were watching the rugby at the the hotel. And then yeah, the gluten free pizzas. Not only are they limited to small, um, they uh, they don't slice them in Birmingham apparently. So I, I love that you're actually answering uh. this question. <laughs> hey, look, we got to treat them all the it's, same. It's the game they... design question that is most pressing <laughs> in the chat. I love it. Uh. Uh, we've got some more questions now, right? Yeah. So we've got a question from uh, Litos, or I don't know, Litos. I'd say uh, Litos. Litos. Uh, do you have any advice for someone who has only worked for an indie studio and wants to move into a bigger company? Um. I mean, I've not gotten a job at a big studio now for quite a few years, so I'm very, very bad. But, like, I would say it's honestly, it's a lot of what we're saying. And if you've got portfolio work, I mean, it depends what job you did and what job you want. But, like, if the work's relevant, then I think you'd be surprised how many indie games, like, AAA or big companies play. Yeah. Like, everyone plays everything, right? Like, if you're a gamer, you're a gamer. And... And therefore, like, it's actually, I've found when I've had those kind of conversations with, with people, like, you, like, people have heard of indie games. People have heard of, maybe people have heard of your indie game. Yeah. Um, and that's um, it's amazing because it demonstrates a lot of stuff that we're talking about. It shows an ability to self-organize. It shows a, you can, it, clearly you can collaborate because otherwise that indie project would never have shipped. <laughs> like, yep. so, so I think. Yeah, I think it's really always portfolio yep. and just, I mean, the key thing is just apply for a million jobs so you get one of them. Like, it's, yep. there's, yeah, it's, it's tough. It's very tough. I mean, yeah. Oh. It, one of the one of the interesting angles. I mean, if I was running a, um, you know, a not indie studio, I don't know what that is, but something that's big, um, and someone was like, "Oh, I used to be, I was, I was doing the indie thing, and now I'm, I don't want to anymore." I would be more interested in why you don't want to anymore mm, than true, yeah. like, like, I, yeah, we're making assumptions that you've shipped games and, and blah 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 blah, and that's all cool. But then, like, yeah, the, I, I would imagine they would probably focus in the sort of like. So you as a person, what makes you want to give up the dream and come and work in the mines? Yeah. You know? How um, badly did you fail? Like, oh. This seems like a good idea to you. <laughs> so, well, so I think one I think thing... It's an interesting thing to think about before, before going. Hmm. You've got to have yeah. a good answer, right? You've got to have a good answer when you're asked. Yeah, and I think another thing is just make sure to be very clear about what you did on this indie project, um, how it's applicable to the job, you know, make sure to research the company that you're going to work for and be able to convince them, like, you know, not necessarily why you're giving up the dream, but, like, you know, how are you going to adapt from something where, you know, you might have tons and tons of control to something where you're you're ready to take, you know, directions and be part of a bigger whole and sort of, you know, say, like, oh, well, you know, I understand that we're trying to hit this deadline or that, you know, the, the market wants this and, you know, despite the fact that this isn't the game that I'd most like to make, this is the game that I understand that we've decided to make and there's so many people involved in this that, you know, you've just got to move with it. Um, but yeah, and I guess the other thing I'd say is that a mistake that I see in a lot of applications is that people will make something um, in their, their portfolio that's good. Um, and I think you need to focus on, you know, one or two things that are really, really great. You know, it's just like this thing really needs to feel super good and just focus on that part, cut the other parts out. Because mm -hmm. 
if I'm reviewing a ton of applications, like I'm only going to play your game for, you know, like a minute or two. Yeah. And so if it's kind of like, oh, there's this really cool thing, like 25 minutes in, it's like I, I probably didn't get to that. So, you know, it's like if you make something that you're actually applying with, you know, focus on like it immediately being clear that one or two aspects of this are really, really great. Yeah. Get to um, the point, right? Yeah, get to the point. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking at the other questions. Uh, I promised Mike we would not talk about the indie apocalypse. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so bored. Has someone, has someone genuinely got a question about the indie apocalypse? Yeah. It might be a whole other podcast. Like that at might least, be a whole yeah. other podcast. We, we, we'll definitely talk about that at yeah. another point. Um, yeah, does Mike want to leak about information about his new thing that he apparently mentioned? I doubt I, it. <laughs> honestly, like the honest answer is there's like there's at least two or three new things right yeah. now, and yeah, it's all very vague. Yeah. All right. So here's here's one from uh, Coffee Jesus with a Z. Hey, um, cool. Hey, cool. <laughs> what is your favorite game growing up, and did you have any particular obsessions? I might shock the audience, but I was a bit of a Mel Gear fan. <laughs> um, I, I can't imagine. You can't tell, right? You can't tell. No. Um, yeah, I was Mel Gear and Deus Ex were like the two, and Half Life. I mi- I was late to my prom because of Half Life. Like I was playing Half Life. <laughs> I missed the limousine. My mum had to drive me to my prom. <laughs> because oh. because I was playing Half-Life. Brilliant. But, you know, it still went very well. I had a lovely evening, uh, so it was fine. But uh, Half-Life nearly ruined it. <laughs> Andrew? Um, oh, wow. Uh, obsessions. I mean, uh, probably... Well, yeah, Half-Life was huge. Obviously, that's what got me into actually making games. But um, before then... Um, Zelda 3, GoldenEye was probably like the big one. Yeah. Um, that was the first game that I got good enough at to beat other people. <laughs> and, uh, I, I still vivid, like it's so, it's so, it's such a sad story. Didn't have a happy time at school, blah, blah, blah. And um, yeah, I remember the day that I uh, discovered amongst our peers, at least, what circle strafing did to a competitive uh, matchup. <laughs> yeah. And uh, oh boy, that was good. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Um, for me, it was uh, Secret of Mana. Um, we oh, used to cool. play that so much. We we just had like a group of neighborhood kids that would all play video games all the time. Um, and, and in fact, one of my you know best friend, childhood friends, like the way I met him was uh, he he moved from the town over, and he literally decided for the whole first day all he was going to do is ride his bike around the block over and over and over again. And then whenever he saw someone, he said, "Do you have a Nintendo?" And if he said yes, he said, we can be friends. <laughs> and so, like, it was, it was actually one of the funny things of, like, you know, all the times we would play Secret of Mana together and then we'd have to go home and we'd have to, like, continue, you know, on our own with the AI characters. And every now and then you just get a call at, like, you know, 7, 7 or 8 p.m., like, the latest your parents will let you stay out and like, I'm at the wall face, boss. I need some help. Can you come over for 20 minutes? And I don't know. I think there was just such a... Uh, I think sort of that experience of getting together and playing a game with all my friends was sort of the thing that we did so much. And I, I don't, we've played through Secret of Mana together 20 or 30 times. And then, like, even in college, a lot of times, like, I was really busy. Um, but they would still drive up to UCLA and, you know, bring the, the Super Nintendo and the multi-tap over and be like, oh, you know, like, let's, let's see if we can speed run through this. And yeah. I still remember when we worked out in my university, we worked out that we could use the internal LAN system yep. as as for Halo, that we could plug Xboxes in, or, and this was before you could plug in a video game console into the internet. <laughs> so we would have our Xboxes around campus, and we'd all be on, like, the landline telephones to each other, like, okay, um, press X. That's amazing. Oh, it's just such a cool, like, yeah. yeah, Halo was that game for me. It was just, that was yeah. me and my friends... Like carrying TVs yeah. like to each other's houses and stuff is awesome. Yeah. So we've got a really, uh, I, I presume, a quick question for Mike. Um, how much time do you dedicate to Thomas was alone while having an actual, while having an actual work? And I, like I, an actual I, job, I, I guess. Yeah. That means, yeah. Um, I worked out once because someone asked me, and it was. I think I did about. I think I probably managed about an hour to two hours every night. And then, like, weekends, I would probably spend about... I would do full work day, so I'd do, like, six, seven hours every every weekend. And it's it's horrible. I look back at it, and I'm like, I fucked... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm really swearing a lot. You're going to have to beep a lot. (laughs) Yeah, we're... we're, You know there's that explicit tag that you have to put on uh, iTunes stuff. Yeah, I'm sorry. If if I can figure out how to get this on iTunes, I would click that. (laughs) Beep beep me out. But I I really, like, I really, like, messed up my life for two years. And And it's one of those things where it's like... I try really hard not to like romanticize it at all because like I don't want anyone else to do it. 
but at the same time like obviously it, it worked out oh, well yeah. for me but there, there is totally an alternate universe where I did all of that and it sold two copies and my girlfriend left me like that's yeah. sorry <laughs> I should point out not because it sold two copies <laughs> but because yeah. I was a terrible boyfriend for yeah. two years just kind of constantly working yeah. Um, and it was it was it was silly, and you know I, I I didn't spend much time with some friends, and kind of faded out of some some social stuff. So it was it was definitely a destructive process. Um, yeah. But you know, obviously, in retrospect, turned out to be a really yeah. really good idea. But like, yeah, it's one of those things that's definitely not healthy. Yeah. yeah. Cool. We've got a question from Real Entropy. Last week, I went to London and showed my game off at an event. I got loads of positive feedback, but I'm really struggling for funding. Any advice for funding projects? So we'll definitely do a whole episode on funding at some point. Um, but like, uh, uh, do either of you have a relatively quick answer to that? I would go say on. just um, if that event wasn't London Indies Meetup thing, go to the London Indies Meetup. Uh, it's the first Monday of every month, I want to say. Um, hit us up on Twitter or something for the details if it wasn't, because um, people there uh, know or work at games publishers, okay. and uh, there are a lot of publishers out there who will throw small amounts of money at small projects because why not you know if it's fun um, and you can come to an agreement uh, go for it so it's quite a healthy market if you like out there at the moment i would say yeah and i wouldn't be embarrassed it. about it like like i think there's a there's a bit of a stigma around publishers i think that's probably a bit silly um a lot of indie games that people like were quietly published or <laughs> entirely funded by someone else yeah. or Platform loudly published holder, or loudly published right but everyone forgets um so like I wouldn't be ashamed of that. Like you, you do what you need to do to build a game and build a business, right? And and publishers are a great way to do that, you know. Um, so I wouldn't I wouldn't like frown at that. There are also those help out there. Like if you're if you're someone who's so if you're British, for example, you know if you're not based in London, there's a lot of local kind of schemes and stuff where they will literally give you money to make games yeah. outside of London because everything's so focused in London. If you're in London, you know there are funds. I think the prototype fund was just announced by the government, yeah. which is like twenty five thousand to build a prototype, or yeah. and then fifty thousand if they like it, or I don't know what yeah. the style, what the criteria <laughs> are. But like but there is definitely be applying. <laughs> <laughs> there is money out there and and I don't think you have to immediately go to the you know early access or kickstarter route though they're sexy and new like they open you up to an audience very early they there's a lot of pressure obviously I mean Andrew can talk more about early access than I can but like there there are other options and there are there is money um and yep. games the great thing about indie games right now especially if you're at the start of your career and you are just like you know you and a buddy or something like you're really cheap comparatively so like there will be people who will take a punt on you because they never know which 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 of these many indies is actually going to make the next hit you only have to look at this year and like the games have really broken out most yeah. of them are from new people most of them are from people who are who are unknown and and a lot of people with money want to befriend those people just before that happens you know uh so yeah i think i think there's there's opportunities out there definitely yeah, I guess the only thing I'd add really quickly is just that there are fun games and there are commercial games and they're not necessarily one and one So the kind of game, like, you know, I think just because you've gotten good feedback doesn't necessarily mean it's the kind of thing that a publisher sees an ROI on. And I think, you know, there's, there's some times where you have to say, like, which one of these do I necessarily, which one of these do I want? Like, is there a way that I can, you know, cover both of these, you know, both parts of this Venn diagram with a game? Um, but yeah, I mean, it, you know, I think if people enjoy your game, you're definitely one step ahead of a lot of other people. Um, and yeah, you've, you've just got to, you know, keep keep trying and talk, you know, try and get the contacts and try and, I don't know, find, find the right connections or find the right publisher or, you know, source of funds for you. Yeah. And that's uh, tricky, and that's going to require some, like, you're actually going to have to go out there and meet people and, and hustle a little bit. And that, that is unfortunately a part of this, you know, that you have to you have to take those risks. But, yeah, good luck. Yeah, best of luck. Unless yeah. you're making something that directly competes with one of my games. <laughs> then Mike will crush you. <laughs> I will destroy you. <laughs> so we got another question for, I can't pronounce this. There's too many vowels in a row. Joop. Um Joop. What are the requirements to work uh, work in a big studio? Is it possible for someone with zero background or experience? Yeah. It, well, it's possible to, if you've got no experience at a big studio. Yeah. I think you have to be able to demonstrate that on the first day you're going to be able to do something. So it's what we, we've been talking about. Portfolio, you've made your own game, you've made a cool map. 
one yeah. of the best of applications I ever had, um, and I think we actually ended up hiring this person at a previous studio I worked out, was um, someone who'd written a six-page essay about their favorite level in Quake. And nice. explained like in detail like this is why the rocket launcher is right where it is because it yeah. means this and you can see it i was reading it like this guy this guy can think like yeah. this guy can be a designer you know like you get it um don't send like a five page document describing the law for your rpg <laughs> and the specific kind of sword that's really important that's less yeah. impressive but like yeah i like I, I think you can but yeah you need to prove it you need to have a portfolio you need to have uh maps that you've made for a game you can't just go i like video games i want a job please i guess the only place you could theoretically manage to do that is qa qa yeah. especially like if, if they're really recruiting heavily because qa is a very skilled job at the higher yeah. levels but they also recruit you know people f fresh out of high school for that so that's a possibility potentially but if you want anything kind of more specialized than that you're going to have to prove that you can do it yeah. Is that fair? Yep. Yeah. That sounds yeah. good to me. <laughs> Next question from uh, Vazan. Uh, what are your opinions on things like green light? None of us have been through green light, have we? Uh, no. No, we're smug, smug bastards. Yeah. Sorry, but I, I mean, I, I think it's you know, it's, it's a filter. Um, I think you know, when it sort of was announced, it was one of these things of oh, this sounds great. This sounds like it's going to be the solution to everything. And I think it hasn't ended up being that. Um, but it has been a filter of sorts. I don't know. It's. I definitely think if it's your only way to get onto Steam and being on Steam is very important, you have no other choice. Um, so you've just kind of got to deal with it. But yeah, it's I don't definitely have better than the old way. Like I remember, like the only, the way Thomas didn't get on Steam until I got a friend who had previously released a Steam game to mm. email someone at Valve begging them. Yeah. And that's how I got on. And that's not a fair system. Like that's yeah. a very. <laughs> gray kind of shady thing it wasn't right whereas green light is at least open and and honestly like i'm not hearing stories anymore like like people with new games um kind of are able to get them through green light now i'm not seeing people like with a get like a good game that's been held in green light for like two years like that it seems that the backlog is being cleared and that games yep. are getting through um you know a lot of games are going through i guess is the the downside of that i mean yeah. for everyone except jim sterling um, <laughs> he, he does very well out of <laughs> games going through green light. but yeah. yeah it's 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 an exciting time but yeah it's, it's competition is it's fierce out there yeah oh and apparently congratulations to uh scott Hennig studios apparently they just got through green light nine days nine days so that's yeah amazing. congratulations but, dude that's really cool awesome what's the name of the game post the name of the game so we can have a yeah. look at uh, yeah. Michael, look at the bottom chat. I think we'll take a few more questions. Um, this one so, is yeah, from. Yeah, we're running an hour. I'm not sure we want to keep people too much. Yeah, on. we'll probably take two more. Let's say um, from Etiak. Um, will medium-sized studios rise again, or are they being squeezed on both sides by the budget and handful of mega triple A's, EA, Activision, Ubisoft, etc., uh, and the agile nature of the multitude of indies? they rose again and you didn't notice yeah <laughs> it's like my honest answer like like the number of games that like are considered triple like that are considered either triple a or indie yeah. but you know the teams are in that mid space um it feels weird to like call them out so i'm not going to but like yeah. there are definitely indie games where you're like that game definitely cost a few million dollars um, yeah. And there's definitely like AAA games where you go, that game didn't cost thirty million dollars. Like you know what I mean? Like, and so yeah. I think that middle ground's there. I think it's a marketing thing. I think basically right now there isn't much value in going to your audience and going, we are middle of the road. We are going to deliver an absolutely adequate experience to you, the player. Like, yeah. if, it, it feels like either you have to say you're indie or you have to go, I am AAA. Um, yeah. But I think those middle-sized studios definitely exist and are definitely releasing interesting stuff. But they're doing it but, using labels that are cooler. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. topping the Steam charts regularly. And, yeah, 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 Exa exactly. It's, it's those games, it's right? Anywhere. There's very um, few games in the top ten on Steam that aren't like multi-million projects, right? Like, yeah. yeah. Cool, and uh, so I'm, I'm going to do two more because I like the, the question after this one as well. <laughs> oh, RPG Tycoon, that's the name of the game. I want to have a look at it. It's a oh, good cool. name. I like the name yeah. of that. I'm nice. going to look at it now. I'm going to buy your game. All right, this one I actually had in... Oh, this one makes... I had in the notes and then I forgot to get to. Uh, how important is it to build connections and network over building pro and freelance work? Oh, that's an interesting one. I have had so many opportunities come through just knowing people, um, but then it would be crazy to say that, you know, uh, I didn't have some sort of reputation or the work that I did yeah. wasn't of some level of quality to sort of make those... 
Yeah. And turn into rather than from opportunities to actual things happening. It doesn't um, matter how much fun you are down the pub if you don't make stuff or you make bad stuff, you're not going to get yeah. the jobs, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, but I feel they're, like they're yeah, sort of. Yeah. Yeah, it feels like there's sort of two steps to getting the job. Like one step one is being noticed, and step two is sort of not messing it up. Um, and I think <laughs> networking is really great for that first part because it's it's hard to convey your personality through a CV or even a cover letter or whatever, and you can easily convey that in person while networking. Um, but you still need to bring bring the goods to back it up. Um, so. Sorry, uh, stream. That was the beginning of the RPG Tycoon soundtrack because I was playing <laughs> it while we were watching. Sorry. Good, good right. advertising for the individual. Sorry, last go. question for from Pete LH. Uh, what's the last game that you guys played that made you think, "Wow, I wish I designed that"? <sighs> Give me a specific part within the game if you want. And this will be our ending question for tonight. Uh, Shadow of Mordor's Nemesis system is yeah, the thing, good, the yeah. last thing where I was like, "God damn it!" Like, that's damn weird. it, that is so good. Um, and um, I mean, I'm sure there are probably games more recently, like Splatoon, for a million reasons. But that's mm -hmm. probably. Like, realistically, I was never going to make Splatoon, but <laughs> the Nemesis system could be applied in so many interesting ways. It's so cool. It's so cool. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, basically, yeah, you, 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 if you get beaten by an orc, then it gets sort of named, and if you kill it, then it gets wounded, and it comes back in both instances to, to get revenge, and it just creates the most amazing dramatic moments. Um, but, yeah. Mike? I guess mine, I guess mine is um, Until Dawn? probably is the most recent one that I was like I think like the well first of all it's just really well written but like uh, the way they do choice in that and the way that they um, and this it just always sounds negative when I say so I get in trouble because this stuff gets quoted and it's like <laughs> I'm taking the piss but the, the like how they've done that efficiently on a budget is impressive like it's yeah. not they make you feel like there's a lot more going on than there is and that's effectively all we do right it's all yeah. smoke and mirrors it's all about creating those illusions so so yeah for me until dawn is just a lovely clean system but the nemesis system is also incredibly yeah. cool too the, the the thing i like about the nemesis system as well is i love like i love it as an actual game design but i love the fact that we all call it a nemesis system like, it's, a, it's like <laughs> the, the AI, branding worked perfectly it's like the ai director yeah. right in left yeah. it's just such a brilliant personification of what is basically dice yeah you know and it's really it's just yeah. really really nice yeah. really really nice Cool. And the last game that I played that I, I just thought I wish I'd made it was Undertale. Um, it was I've just, heard you know, so many good things about that. It's love incredible. That. It's so it's so clever and just sort of the idea of, you know, making an RPG where nobody has to get hurt and like, mm. you know, the writing in it is great and it just like it you know, it, it constantly sets expectations and breaks them and sets new expectations and breaks them and it's just it's one of these things of like you never want to stop playing because you have no idea what in the world could be around the next corner. And, you know, I started following um Toby Fox on Twitter and it's just like it's incredible because it's like after playing the game and reading, you know, his personality and so on and, and Twitter is just sort of like it is the personification of him into a game and it's just I love it's, when you it's just that. wonderful. I feel the same yeah. way I need to play ROM at some point because I love yeah. those guys as yeah, well. Definitely. I need to play read only memories. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's I love that's the that's the thing in your games can do so beautifully is just capture yeah. a human being. Yeah. Cool. All right, so that was the show. Thank you guys so much for coming along and asking questions. I'll read through the rest of the questions and try and see which ones we can get to next time. Next time will not be next week because I think people are at Game City and I need to figure out how to like get stuff on iTunes and stuff. Are you guys going to Game City at all? Uh, I, I, I every year I think about it and I'm like I might go oh, down should, for a bit. Great. Oh, no. We'll you see. Should. We'll maybe. maybe. It's wonderful. Days, but missing it. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Thanks everyone for um, joining in and um, yeah, look forward to doing this again. And thank you too, of course, for joining me. Thanks very much, guys. Yeah, check us out on Twitter uh, and you know give us a follow on Twitch, etc. Yeah. Uh, and then, like you say, we're going to be putting an audio out on uh, iTunes, etc. Um, yep. So people can spread it about once. Oh yeah, should, should I? You know, I should probably say, where can everyone find you on Twitter and such? Oh, uh, Mike. On. Me, I'm <laughs> annoy <laughs> annoyingly present on Twitter. Um, <laughs> I'm at Mike Biffle. Uh, yeah, I'm really annoying though. Please, you know, don't follow me because I'm irritating and loud. Basically, follow other games industry people. <laughs> if I ever say anything interesting, it will get retweeted. You don't need to follow me. It's fine. <laughs> uh, I'm at Spilt Milk Studio, no S on the end. Um, and yeah, I'm. I've been grumpy recently, but I promise I won't Aww. be. <laughs> uh, cheer up. And I'm. Uh, I'm at one of Moo. Brilliant. Cool. All right. Bye.
See, uh, the, you can wave as goodbye as long as you like, but I know, I'm, the I one who's, I'm the one who chooses when this ends. <laughs> we can just make this really awkward. It is really awkward. It's like when you it's like when you're walking to the bus stop and you say goodbye and you realise that the other guy is going in the other direction. I like the Smithy as freeze framed himself. The thing is, how long can he hold that? Of course, you guys can sabotage this by hanging up because and you will reveal screenshots oh, of my true. next project. Oh. <laughs>